Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show, and I'm Dr. Robert Lufkin. Magnetic resonance, or MR, imaging is one of the most powerful non-invasive medical testing tools. And when we combine it with the emerging power of artificial intelligence, truly great things are possible. Today, we are looking specifically at applying this technology to the brain in order to help understand dementia from one of the leaders in the field. Weir Onesen is a professor at both Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam and Delft University of Technology. He is a founder and scientific lead at Quantib, an AI company in medical imaging. He received a master's degree in physics and a PhD in medical imaging from Utrecht University. In this episode, we are experimenting with a new uh, format of having a presentation rather than the interview style that we usually do. Please let us know how you feel about it. Dr. Neeson starts with a review of the 2012 ImageNet breakthroughs in machine learning that drive the current progress in artificial intelligence. He also mentions a type of magnetic resonance imaging pulse sequence known as DTI, which is an abbreviation for diffusion tensor imaging, which measures the diffusion components across images, which in the brain turn out to be particularly useful to define brain fiber tracks. He mentions the hippocampus, which we will learn about in other episodes, is a paired structure in our brain, which is active in memory. Measuring its volume can be a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease risk. Two other abbreviations he mentions are MICA Society, the Magnetic or the Medical Image Computing and Computer Assisted Intervention Society, and also ESR, which is the European Society of Radiology. This presentation is fairly technical, but does cover state-of-the-art challenges in applying artificial intelligence to MR of the brain to help with our understanding of dementia. Now, please enjoy this presentation with Dr. Wero Neeson. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure today to present on the topic of when artificial intelligence meets dementia. Uh, my name is uh, Wero Neeson. I'm a professor of biomedical image analysis at Erasmus MC in Rotterdam, large university medical center in the Netherlands, and Delft University of Technology. And I'm also uh, linked to Quantip. And uh, as a disclosure, I'm also uh, the founder, scientific lead, and, and share, shareholder of Quantip. So if you work these days in data science, artificial intelligence, it's quite exciting times. It's uh, on the top cover of many magazines, uh, the, the enormous possibilities of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And uh, even though this technology dates back uh, over half a century ago, it's been really uh, uh, some uh, landmark development in 2012 that brought all this excitement. It was linked to a um, challenge, an uh, ImageNet challenge, which was organized um, at Stanford, in which teams were competing in order to recognize objects in images. And at the 2012 competition, a neural network, which takes the, um, the raw image in, as input and outputs uh, a classification, whether a certain object is present in an image, all of a sudden uh, really outperformed many of the other techniques and because of that, uh, a lot of people jumped towards the use of neural networks. And now it's not only for image recognition, but in many fields that um, this technology is being employed. And uh, it's good probably to think why this ImageNet competition uh, or, and this algorithm was so successful. So this didn't come out of the blue. It was uh, many years that this uh, competition had been organized. And the fact that a large number of imaging data that had been annotated were available for algorithm developers to, to use them to train and optimize their algorithms was actually key in order to uh, uh, make sure that we had progress in the field. So uh, I think there's two aspects that are really uh, uh, very important. Uh, and that is that uh, this, this, this concept of 
open data to be able to train from, and also the, the challenge aspect that you are uh, uh, um, really organizing comp uh, competition and that you can ab objectively evaluate how well an algorithm performs. These two aspects, I think, have made that uh, progress was um, substantial progress has been made in that, that field. Uh, since then, we see an enormous uh, uptake of machine learning, not only in the medical domain, basically in all domains of society. Uh, and you see that uh, in the field that where we are, in which, uh, or where, where at least I'm working, in which machine learning meets medical imaging, that actually the magnitude of papers, scientific papers of uh, uh, machine learning is now even surpassing the number of papers on, on medical imaging. But it's actually the merger of the two, the merger of medical imaging and machine learning, that is a very exciting area. Uh, there have also been some debates about uh, uh, the risk of artificial intelligence. For example, the risk of artificial intelligence to replace uh, jobs of clinicians. I think by now we know that the current state of the art in machine learning and AI is very useful. We can uh, build very strong algorithms, but we really are complementing human intelligence rather than replacing it because um, there's distinct things that current state-of-the-art AI algorithms are good at, and there are certain things um, human uh, experts are very good at. And, and, and at least for, the, for, the, for the, the, the coming period, it is about how can we optimally utilize AI in the hands of experts like radiologists, like neurologists, in order to, uh, 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 to do the best for our patients, to, make, to take the best diagnosis. So this is, uh, this is, this is really the, the, the main topic of this lecture. How can, you, can we ensure that the enormous potential of these AI techniques, these neural networks that can learn from examples, can be uh, utilized in clinical practice? Now, if I first look at my own domain, the field of medical image processing, we see that actually AI has already made a large impact. Uh, we're developing many algorithms, and these algorithms uh, are aimed at making the field of radiology more objective and quantitative. We want to turn medical imaging data into numbers that somehow are linked to the state or presence of, uh, of disease, or that can be used to uh, uh, characterize human anatomy or human function. And um, because of these deep learning techniques and the possibility to link imaging directly to outcome, we see a second movement. Not only are we going to use AI in order to uh, quantify and uh, um, describe um, image data more objectively, we also are interested in directly linking imaging characteristics to things, to outcomes that are clinically relevant. For example, we could try to predict based on imaging data with a neural network, what the subtype of a tumor is, or we could try to predict based on MRI scans of the brain, if someone is at increased risk of getting cognitive decline or dementia. And uh, we could, for example, look at uh, differential diagnosis of, of dementia. So th this is not all straightforward. And, it's, uh, and, and people perhaps have underestimated how, uh, um, how, how it can be more difficult, perhaps in the medical domain compared to other domains, in order to really make an impact. So first, what we have to realize is that in the health domain, we need to do more than image perception. Eventually, to, take a, to make a diagnosis, uh, we combine uh, multiple sources of information. That means that if we train an algorithm, Often we need no more than image data. So we need uh, uh, all types of uh, <coughs> other data, clinical data, genetic data. And uh, that becomes uh, more difficult to, to collect all these data, especially if we work with larger data sets over multiple hospitals. Then we need many data because human biology and pathology is highly variable. And, and, and we want to have a representative data set that includes uh, all the variation that is present in, in clinical practice. And often also data bias may be an issue. 
if we train our algorithms on different data than we apply our algorithm, they may not perform as, uh, as expected. So, <clears throat> so there are some challenges, but it's, it's really worthwhile to face these challenges, to address these challenges and develop uh, uh, algorithms based on this technology. And why? Because it really helps us to build what we call a learning healthcare system. Uh, this technology gives us the power to learn from previous patients, to diagnose the next patient better, to do a better prognosis and to do a better treatment selection. So I will uh, uh, illustrate that uh, uh, with the research we've been doing. And I will start with the research we did in the context of a population imaging study. <clears throat> so in a population study, we are interested in understanding uh, uh, why certain people age healthy, why other people develop diseases. And in order to really get a good insight in it, we need to collect a, a large amount of data. And because of that reason, these kind of studies are, are very uh, good candidates uh, to develop and train uh, AI algorithms on because of the quality and the magnitude of the data that are available. So what is the design of such a population imaging study? If you think about such a population imaging study, what we do of as many people that we can afford, we uh, collect uh, risk factors. This may be your uh, genetic liability for disease. So we can do uh, GWAS uh, data, but we can also look at uh, lifestyle, uh, whether people smoke or not, diet, environmental factors. And eventually we are interested in which risk factors really lead to neurological outcomes such as cognitive decline, dementia, stroke. And normally this relationship between risk factors and outcome is then a black box. But if in such a population image uh, study, you start to image frequently, you can start to open the black box. And in this way, you can uh, uh, visualize changes that happen to the brain that are, for example, associated with neurological neurodegenerative processes, so atrophy of the brain or the occurrence of brain lesions. And uh, then you can start to investigate the relationship between risk factors and changes in appearance of the brain or change in appearance of the brain and uh, relevant clinical outcomes. Or you can combine uh, uh, risk factors with an MR brain image in order to predict outcomes. So this really calls for sort of a, a data science approach in which you link a lot of data of subjects, including imaging data to, to relevant clinical outcomes. Now, a, a good question would be, would it be, is this really a sensible approach? Is there information in the image data that, can, that we can use, especially to, to identify uh, uh, a disease in an early, early stage? And uh, here you see a very nice study, which was conducted uh, now about eight years ago, in which we, uh, we tried to address specifically that question. And uh, what we did, we took about a thousand subjects of the Rotterdam study, and we looked at white matter pathologies, white matter lesions, white matter hyperintensities in these MR brain images. And we know that an increased occurrence of these uh, white matter hyperintensities are uh, associated with an increased risk of stroke and an increased risk of dementia. Now we then used some image processing to spatially register the baseline scan to the follow-up scan. We segmented automatically the white matter hyperintensities in both scans and then we uh, 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 divided the brain in the white matter in four regions those regions in which the white matter appeared normal, both at baseline and follow-up, those regions in which there was already a white matter hyperintensity at the baseline image, and those regions where white matter lesions had grown or where new white matter lesions appeared. And what we did then is we went back to the baseline scan and we started to compare these four regions in the MR images uh, and all the MR sequences that we had whether there was any statistically significant difference between these regions. Now, if you looked, and here I show just one example for, 
fractional anisotropy that we can derive from diffusion tensor MRI. And uh, this measure is uh, somehow related to the microstructural integrity of the, of the brain, of the white matter pathways. So if it's affected, then actually uh, uh, um, it is a marker for, for neurodegeneration. And what we saw here is that this marker was already different at the baseline scan in which the, the, the scan that we, we normally interpret looked normal, but this marker was already different in regions that only later were visualized years later as a white matter lesions. So this indicates for us that somehow already a subclinical disease process is going on. There's changes happening in the white matter uh, before white matter lesions appear. Uh, and, and that information currently we're not using in order to, to predict, for example, cognitive decline of dementia. So this actually tells us that it makes sense to, to think of these AI approaches and data science approaches in which you use all of the information and all the MR images to be able to predict better uh, uh, relevant um, outcomes. So in our uh, uh, research group and also uh, um, in, in, in our collaborations with the, with, the, with the Rotterdam study, we started to, to, to address this problem as a data science problem. So we started to fully automate the biomarker extraction of all the subjects that are included in the Rotterdam study, such that you get a descriptor that uh, uh, per individual we have information about uh, the, the brain tissue, uh, the presence of atrophy, uh, uh, localization and volume of white matter lesions, how different regions of the brain are connected, etc. And we uh, uh, utilize all this information to start to describe uh, um, every individual in the, in the Rotterdam study. And now I would like to show you that this research now really has been impacted greatly or this processing has been impacted greatly by artificial intelligence. And I will show you by one example. This is an example of an algorithm that we developed to segment the white matter pathways from diffusion tensor MRI. Uh, we used to have a method for that that combined an atlas that we match. So we match, match an, an atlas of an, sort of an average uh, person to an individual in order to have a, a prior where are different uh, uh, white matter uh, pathways located. And then we used uh, uh, tracking on the diffusion tensor images in order to uh, uh, determine the segmentation of the white ma matter pathways. And this full procedure would take uh, uh, multiple hours to process one single image. Now, what we've done now, we've developed a novel algorithm, and this is based on such a neural network that was a different type of neural network, but the principle is the same as in, um, in the ImageNet challenge. And this, uh, uh, um, this network takes diffusion tensor images as input and as output provides a segmentation of the white matter pathways. This uh, network is trained by, by thousands of examples. And after it has been trained, it uh, proves to be a very accurate and robust algorithm for fully automatic segmentation of tracts. But now a single tract can be analyzed in less than a second. So you see an enormous disruptive development in which uh, the image processing becomes much faster because of artificial intelligence. Now we have brought this kind of uh, uh, technologies and integrated that into uh, a clinical workstation. So this is work with Quantip. It's now uh, um, integrated in an, an FDA approved workstation, Quantip ND. And the idea of this workstation is really to, to, to make the next step in radiology to make it more objective and quantitative. So what you see here is that uh, uh, similar imaging biomarkers related to the volume of the brain of different lobes of the hippocampus, the presence of white matter lesions, also the change of, uh, if you have multiple scans, the change of the volume of the brain over time, that those markers are not only calculated with these tools, but that we also provide reference data of this population-based Rotterdam study, such that you can interpret these markers 
and see how an individual person deviates from, from, from their peer population. So uh, I think um, there's an enormous uh, potential and promise of these uh, uh, technologies, but, but really we need to work together, uh, academia, industry, clinical end users, in order to uh, ensure that these algorithms make a, a, a positive impact into, into clinical practice. So first and foremost, what we need is in order to have good quality algorithms, we need to train algorithms with state-of-the-art methods on high quality and large numbers of data that are representative for clinical practice. So in that sense, it's important that we collaborate to ensure that the algorithms are optimized in a multi-center setting. Then we need proper validation strategies. You need to be able to evaluate the performance of algorithms in order to know how you can use them in clinical practice. And finally, it's important that these kind of algorithms are seamlessly integrated into the workflow. So, so one of the things that I think is important is that we work towards better reuse of health data to optimize algorithms. You see that everywhere where large data resources become available, the whole uh, field of artificial intelligence gets a boost. And a lot of people start to develop algorithms that are more informative, more accurate, and have more impact. So, uh, uh, so, so we should globally uh, start to build infrastructures and promote the reuse of data, of course, in a responsible uh, manner and, 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 and taking care and adhering to privacy guidelines and, and, uh, and consent of reuse of data. But utilizing data to train algorithms is also in, 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 the, in the public interest. In the Netherlands, we are working because of that reason uh, towards uh, an infrastructure that enables distributed learning. With the, the idea of distributed learning is that you don't have to bring all your data centrally, but rather that an algorithm can be trained even if uh, data reside at multiple locations. Uh, you actually uh, bring a, a, a network to all the sites, you, 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 you look how you optimize it locally, but you share results of that optimization. And in this way, you can uh, uh, optimize an algorithm in a distributed fashion. So uh, this is something that uh, for also at this moment, this kind of infrastructures don't really exist. So it's good that we build them. So for a, a, a company like uh, our, our, our company Quantip, we really have to invest uh, in, in networks of partners so here you see an example of a recent uh, a network that we built. This is not in the neuro domain, but in the, in the prostate domain in which uh, we work with multiple clinical centers in order to uh, get training data, to train algorithms, uh, to optimize our algorithms, because this is the only way to get algorithms that are sufficiently accurate in order to be used in, in, in clinical practice. So uh, the, the next step after training algorithms is validation. And, and here uh, a warning is in place for a lot of things that, ha that happen in, in, in literature. It's, it's easy to claim a certain performance of an algorithm, but if you, if you do it on a retrospective data set, then often this, this can be a biased data set or a data set that is similar to the one that was used uh, when you trained the algorithm. And for AI algorithms, it's really important to have an indication of how well they work in a clinically realistic setting. So uh, uh, an approach we always uh, take is that uh, next to trying to build a, a training data set that is of uh, uh, high quality, we also estimate what is the accuracy on a totally independent data set so that we can provide uh, numbers on that and that we can estimize, uh, estimate generalizability. And uh, uh, here we, we really think that we can learn from this image next challenge in the medical imaging domain. And uh, since 2007 in uh, uh, medical image analysis conferences, we now also have the concept of challenges. The fact that we objectively compare multiple algorithms around a certain task. 
So we also collaborate there between the machine learning and the medical image analysis community and different clinical community. So an important collaboration is between the MICAI Society. So the MICAI Society is the largest uh, uh, um, scientific society in the field of medical image computer image computing and computer assisted interventions. So there you have a lot of data scientists and people in machine learning and AI that develop algorithms for inter interpreting image data. And MICAI uh, has, a, has a long tradition of organizing challenges, but they're now teaming up with the American College of Radiology, RSNA, ESR, in order to uh, ensure that these challenges are uh, being initiated from a relevant clinical uh, uh, question, a, a relevant clinical use case. And here, what is uh, quite important to mention is, is one of the initiatives of the American College of Radiology has been to, uh, uh, to generate a directory of relevant AI use cases with information, what kind of uh, input data is needed, what kind of anal analysis should be done, what kind of metrics should be used. And this is an important guideline for uh, developers of algorithms. So I think this is something we have to work out in multiple domains and also in the field of dementia, uh, um, uh, ensuring that we create clear use cases and also collect the data around them will help to uh, further improve the quality and the impact of AI tools for dementia. So this really is a collaborative eff effort. So the, the startups in AI often have the, 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 the best technology, but you need to co-work with, for example, university medical centers, uh, clinics in order to get the data and uh, to distribute sometimes also these smaller companies have to work with larger companies. So it's also a, a joint effort by multiple parties to ensure that we, uh, that we bring the enormous potential of AI for health, for medical imaging to, to clinical practice. And there's a nice article by Rekt et al. that describes uh, uh, the, the, the steps that need to be taken for the, for the introduction of these technologies. So um, summarizing, I think uh, uh, it's not only in the field of dementia, but also in other fields, we will see that we will move towards better use of previously seen patients in order to diagnose and treat the next patient better. So we need to learn from, from our previous patients. And an important step for our field, learning from the field of computer vision in which this image net challenge was so successful, is that we have to make our data better accessible to learn from. And uh, we also have to do a good job of validating our al algorithms. And uh, essentially this means we, we need to co-create, we need to bring the, the people that know AI, they know how to uh, develop it, know how to turn it into tools with a good user interface, know how to integrate it in the workflow. We have to link those to, to, to clinicians that, that have the clinical question, uh, uh, that wanna advance their uh, field of practice to jointly develop the next generation of tools. And uh, it's very exciting for us to be in that field and, 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 and make a contribution there. So with this, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. No, this is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking of it because of something you have seen here. If you find this to be of value of you, please hit that like button and subscribe to support the work we do on this channel. Also, we take your suggestions and advice very seriously. Please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching and we'll hope to see you next time.